Okay. This is uh, Mark Thompson. I'm the deputy managing editor of the Japan Times. And tonight, this is the first we're hosting a live uh, panel discussion. Sorry, I think we're good now, sorry. All right, so our uh, panelists are um, from the left, uh, Baye uh, McNeil. He's the author of two critically acclaimed books on life in Japan. And he's been a columnist for the Japan Times uh, since 2014. Um, this column is called Black Eye, and it focuses on the, li the lives of people of African descent living in Japan, and he's been living here since uh, 2004. So welcome by it. Okay, thank you for having me. Um, next is uh, Dr. John G. Russell. He's a professor of cultural anthropology at the Faculty of Regional Studies, Gifu um, University. Uh, he's taught there for 23 years. And his research focuses on uh, the representation of, of race and otherness in American and, and Japanese popular culture. Um, and he's been living on and off uh, in Japan for about 30 years. And uh, John also wrote a uh, piece about the history of blackface uh, for the Japan Times, um, I believe it's 2015. <clears throat> Welcome, John. Thank you. Thank you. And then we have um, Yuta Aoki, who is a popular uh, YouTuber. Uh, his channel is called That Japanese Man Yuta. And uh, he conducts uh, man on the street interviews, um, often in Shibuya, with uh, Japanese people about uh, issues, uh, often cross cultural issues. Um, so thank you for taking the time out today, Yuta. Thank you for having me. Okay. All right, so um, we want to talk initially about the event that, that triggered this. Um, it happened on New Year's Eve. It was a, a TV program, a comedy, like a seven-hour comedy variety program on probably one of the most viewed um, programs uh, of the year. Uh, it was on Nippon Telebi. It's called... Uh, I know I'm gonna get this wrong. Downtown no uh, gaki gaki tsukai, tsukai no arehende. We would call it gaki tsukai. Uh, so um, take over. You, you were sitting at home while watching New Year's Entertainment. Yeah. And what <laughs> <laughs> what yeah. did you see? Uh, I saw. Hamada-san emerged from, I'm not sure what it was, some kind of cabinet. And uh, he was in blackface. And, you know, I couldn't see beyond that. I mean, people told me he was supposed to be Eddie Murphy. Or he was dressed up like Eddie Murphy. But as soon as I saw black faces and the black, you know, curly afro and all that stuff, I was just turned off to the entire program. Okay, so we're, we're talking about... Um, uh... Hamada, they call Hamachan, of one member of the, the com Oodai duo, the comedy duo called Downtown, yes. right? And um, the, the theme of the program was uh, American, American Police, I believe. And uh, they introduced, everybody else was dressed up as like uh, kind of ordinary American police, but uh, Hamada... Uh, came out dressed as uh, Eddie Murphy's character in uh, Beverly Hills Cop, right? Exactly. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I, I was uh, I wasn't surprised, it, you know, like you know, like shocked. It was just uh, it's just very disturbing to see that you know on the number one program of the year practically. Um, that they would do something like this. So that was, you know, it was appalling. And uh, immediately, you know, I, I turned off the program and I went and uh, hopped on social network. Okay. And uh, 
you tweet it. Well, after I took a couple of screenshots, that is. <laughs> right, right. Make a few people. Because I wanted to post about it. I mean, I, I'm, I tweet, you know, daily. So there's nothing new for me to tweet, you know, the good and the bad of what I see, you know, in my life. And, you know, this would have been one of the bad ones. And so I tweeted uh, that this was the third time this week that there had been a blackface occurrence in Japan. There was two other programs early in the week that featured a, a Japanese comedian or a Japanese actor in blackface. So I tweeted that initially. And I said that, you know, you know the, uh, we got to do better than this, Japan. You know, you're making it difficult to love you here. Mm -hmm. uh, and you really try you need to do better than this. You know, blackface needs to stop. And I made a couple of hashtags. And I think it was the same hashtags I used back in 2015. And um, I put, uh, this is not a good look. So mm -hmm. that was my first tweet, if I recall correctly. Yeah, let me, let me just read the tweet. The, the, the tweet. You said, uh, note to Japanese performing in hashtag blackface. Hashtag blackness is not a punchline nor a prop. Need jokes, get better writers. Need a, a black character, get an actor, a black actor that speaks Japanese. And there are several. But please, hashtag stop blackface uh and then you say in in japanese the same thing um not a good look so that was the the um initial tweet and that was the second tweet second tweet first, okay sorry that was the second tweet the first tweet was the one i was saying about you know that's make japan's making it really difficult to love this country when you do stuff like this right and how did that how did that tweet do on social media uh, I didn't pay much attention to it. I just, you know, I'm I'm accustomed to my tweets. Generally, you know, they'll get a couple of retweets, but you know, nothing, you know, right. nothing like this. Nothing viral. You know, people right. you know, comment, but I didn't really get on to to engage people because on Twitter, the it's not a really friendly place to engage people often. But I found right to my engaging on Facebook. So I went to Facebook and I put similar posts up. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I was talking to people on Facebook about it, but yeah, I didn't really engage with But Twitter was the first place I went. Okay, well, the last time I checked, I think it was maybe earlier today, it, I think it had three, that particular tweet had 3,000 retweets and about 5,000 uh, likes. So it it did well. It traveled, it traveled far. Um, it got around, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think what really caused it to pick up uh, momentum was I was, uh, there was a couple of Japanese people who read the tweet who, you know, speak English and they contacted me and they agreed with what I was saying. And, and one of them, her name is a uh, Yoshina. She said, let me translate your tweets into Japanese. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you'll probably be able to reach the people who really need to hear about this you know, more easily. So she, you know, translated my tweets into Japanese and that's when it really took off, I think. Right, right. Because it was reaching Japanese people who were really much more engaged in, in this program than foreigners were. Hmm. So, yeah, I think that's what really made it pick up momentum. Okay. And then not too long after that, um, Huffington Post Japan contacted you. Is that correct? Yeah, that was... Uh, Maybe the next day, but mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I was I was on social network until about three or four that morning, and then mm -hmm. next day I got a contact from from a reporter at Huffington Post, and he wanted to interview me about the uh, you know what was happening on social media that it had gotten all these retweets and yeah that went it, the interview went really well he was he was a pretty conscientious reporter good guy. And, you know, he interviewed me for about, you know, 20 minutes. And he said it's probably going to be um, in online by tomorrow. But actually, it took a couple of days. I think he said his editors were reviewing it and they were, you know, concerned about this and that. It took a couple of days for it to go up. But, um, yeah, once it did go up, and then I think Yahoo Japan, you know, put it on their aggregator. Mm -hmm. And that's when, you know, the floodgates opened. Right. 
And it was trending on the front page of, of Yahoo Japan for about two days, right? Yes. After that. And then, and then beyond that, uh, you were, it was picked up by a lot of uh, major overseas media. Uh, BBC interviewed you the other day. And uh, yeah, you know, the day after Yahoo picked it up, the BBC contacted me. And I think initially it was BBC Singapore. Mm -hmm. Interested in, in, you know, recording an interview with me. And they were going to edit it into, you know, one of their news snippets. And uh, they did that. They interviewed me and recorded it. And then they posted it. And then like, maybe an hour later, BBC World News contacted me and they said oh we'd like to interview you too live so that was a, that was a surprise and uh so that evening maybe about five hours after their phone call we we did an interview live on on bbc world news that was uh that's pretty nerve-wracking i had never been on a live news program international news program before so mm. but um i think i did really well i mean i was very conscious i was very conscious of what i wanted to say you know, I was very prepared to, to you know, to, to make some points, to, 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 to push, not just to make a complaint, but to actually present solutions as well. And I think I, I, think I accomplished that, so. Mm. Bring up, I felt like <laughs> throwing up the entire time. <laughs> um, so I, I, did, I think I did pretty well with that. Okay, okay. I mean, the, the, key, the key issue that I wanted to tackle during that interview was, that first off, that Japan, I don't think Japan is a racist country. And I didn't want to get labeled a racist country. And that's part of the reason I started this campaign in the first place, because I think that if you if Japan continues to do this type of blackface programming, they're going to be labeled a racist country because the rest of the world is going to view it that way. And that's you know, it's not it's not an accurate portrayal of what this country is about. So that's that was my impetus for for with sadness in the first place to try to prevent that from that that type of branding that type of stigma to be attached to japan and so i tried to make that point on on bbc i think i was and that there's some simple solutions to these to 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 um race related questions that might come up in the in the producers rooms if you had someone of foreign descent in that room at the time Maybe they would have been able to tell them, listen, um, if you do blackface um, with the entire world watching, you're probably going to get a lot of pushback from, you know, from other countries, particularly in the states in uh, countries where there's a, a great deal of um, African um, of people of African descent. But um, there's no one there probably that to, to to advise them in that way, and this is the result. So mm -hmm. that's the kind of solutions I tried to present on BBC, and hopefully that that message would filter down to um, Japanese um, viewers and they would get a idea of what I'm trying to accomplish here. It's not about Japan bashing because I love this country. That's why I've lived here for 13 years. But um, I, I really think that if they continue to do this kind of racialized mockery that is going to cause them a great deal of problems, particularly with the whole world coming here in, in the days to come, uh, in the years to come, what well, the World Cup is coming soon, as well as the Olympics. So I think, you know, preparing yourself, this is a way for Japan to prepare itself for what's coming, the kind of scrutiny they're going to be under, hmm. you know, by the entire globe. And, you know, hopefully they, they learn from this, but I'm not sure they have. <laughs> I just want to follow up on the uh, one of our reporters uh, called. Uh, Nippon to be Japan, I guess, Japan uh, television, but for a quote, and uh, they said, we are aware of different opinions surrounding this issue, and we will refer to the feedback we received when producing uh, future shows. So, um, and, then, and then they showed the repeat of the program twice. Yeah, right. so, <laughs> so that, that's their response. Their response to, to is to to do uh, to repeat the programming, so hmm. I don't know. Maybe they didn't really get the message, which is sad. It's really uh, unfortunate. Hmm. Um. So uh, you were involved 
and it's a slightly similar incident about two years ago when there was a, a blackface uh, a group a singing group uh, called Rats and Star. Yes. That, um, we're going to perform with a girl idol group, um, and you arranged a petition um, protesting this, and in the end, this this didn't air, right? Correct. I'm, I'm summing it up really quickly there, but um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, there was a uh, at the time. You know, Momo Ido Clovisetto and uh, Rats and Star preparing to go on Fuji TV in blackface. And they had sent out some promotional photos of them, you know, dressed up like uh, minstrels. And, you know, uh, of course, if that was responded to very uh, negatively by a great deal of the, um, of the social networking. So, uh, of the social networks. And I did a few tweets and also i i, I, um, I kind of spearheaded a, a petition i i went to um, change.org i put together a petition to send to the advertisers that that sponsor the program music fair and you know try to petition them to to encourage fuji tv not to air this programming and i also sent the open letters to michelle obama she was en route to japan at the time Mm -hmm. so I sent the open letter to Michelle Obama, and I sent the open letter to um, Ambassador Kennedy as well, so that you know she could be made aware. You know what's happening here, and how you know this is uh, something that sh shouldn't be tolerated anymore. And um, yeah, uh, Fuji TV responded by editing, but they didn't say why. Mm -hmm. They didn't mention why they edited the programming, and no, there was no news coverage of. Of a major corporate, a major uh, channel, a major station changing their programming as a, in response to a petition or in, in response to a, a, a movement. There was no mention of it in any of the media in ja in Japan. I mean, Japan Times, of course, covered it, and um, you, you know, some Western media did. I think Vox and USA Today. You know, some of the the Western media covered it, but there was no mention of it in in any of the Japanese media. Not even Huff Post or uh, Yahoo at the time, none of them kind of, none of them mentioned the story. So Japanese were not aware that this had under, that this had taken place because I, but I believe if they had been aware, maybe something like this wouldn't have taken place. Maybe Hamada-san would have been advised. Listen, we saw what happened back in 2015. Maybe we shouldn't, you know, go this route this time. And we see what happened with um, all Nippon Airlines Airways. Mm -hmm. Uh, a and A, we saw what happened with them. You know, this this could cause this this could hurt us fiscally. You know, this could be very damaging to us. You know, financially or in other ways, you know, image wise. So maybe we should reconsider this black this blackface programming. But um, they 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 were they were not cognizant that this issue had taken place back in 2015. So they just moved forward without any hesitation, and mm -hmm. here we are. So, but that was a different network. Network, right? It was a different network. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But you know, if it had been on the news, all networks would have been aware of it. Yeah. 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 So I'm not sure why the media didn't cover it. I mean, because they definitely were aware of it. I mean, it was all over Twitter. There's no way they're not covering this stuff. in Nihon in English and in Nihongo. So there's no way they're not aware of it. And right. I, you know, when I was sending out tweets, I was hashtagging and and tagging. Fuji TV and the advertisers, so that they they, oh, they were all aware. The letter was sent directly to the advertisers and to the, to Fuji TV. So it's not that the media wasn't aware of it; it's just that they decided not to respond to it. I'm not sure why. Mm -hmm. so, so the the reason I brought that up is um, well, it's, it's it's to say that this latest in incident is not new; that it, it has been a um, Kind of, I wouldn't say a tradition, but it, it does come up on um, Japanese TV from time to time, and um, it also has a longer history. Um, so, John, could you tell us a little bit about the uh, briefly about the the history of blackface in Japan? Okay. Uh, well, first of all, a lot of people seem to think that you know Japanese and and blackface um, don't go together; that they 
Japanese don't really know all that much or don't have much of an experience with blackface, and that just is not the case. Uh, in 1854, when uh, Commodore Matthew Perry uh, returned to Japan, he came to Japan in, in 1852. He came, he returned in 1854. Uh, he came to conclude a, a treaty with Japan that basically opened Japan up to, to the West open Japan's ports up to the West. And at the conclusion of that treaty, he treated the Japanese to a, uh, a minstrel show. Uh, this was a show performed by members of his crew, his the white members of his crew. There were also blacks uh, on uh, uh, members of Perry's crew as well, uh, but they uh, were involved in the minstrel show. Uh, the white crew members uh, performed uh, in blackface. They were called the uh, Ethiopian minstrels, uh, they were also called um, the Japanese oleo uh, minstrels. Uh, and these were all uh, white uh, crew members uh, performing in jackface and, and, and blackface. And some of the, uh, the skits and the routines, the songs that they sang, uh, one of them was um, uh, Oh Mr. Coon. Uh, there was another one called Docky's Serenade, uh, Tar River. Uh, all of these kind of, of quite, you know, disturbing racist um, performances that were common uh, in the United States at the time, but which were brought to Japan by Perry uh, in 1854. Uh, the Japanese who were exposed to this, these performances were enthralled. They found it very entertaining. They laughed. There are uh, records at the time that say, you know, how much they enjoyed and were amused by these performances. Um, so you, you've got Perry uh, coming into Edo Bay at the time, uh, and it just wasn't in, 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 in Edo. It was also uh, performed aboard his ship, the uh, Powhatan, uh, in uh, uh, Yokohama and uh, uh, Hakutate. Uh, so uh, you, you see it um, taking place in many areas of Japan. Uh, but also what's interesting is about you know, 10, 20 years later, um, you see Japanese performers now in blackface. Uh, I have a photograph of a Japanese entertainer from the 1870s who has his top hat, he has his tails, he has his gloves, and he's in, in the requisite blackface. Um, and you see that tradition continuing uh, well into the 1920s, in the 1930s, where you had Japanese stage performers uh, in the equivalent of, of kind of vaudeville routines uh, in theaters in uh, Asakusa uh, performing in blackface. Um, uh, you see uh, Japanese performers uh, performing in blackface in uh, films uh, in the 1930s. Uh, and the medium would change but you would still see these performances taking place. Uh, so that, um, let's just take, for example, um, animation. Uh, there's a 1940 film uh, called um, Kumoto Chudip, The uh, Spider and the Tulip, which was made, I think, in, in the 1940s, 1943, I think, which depicts a spider, a black spider, a menacing black spider, uh, decked out in basically minstrel wear. He has a straw hat, he's strumming a banjo, he has white gloves on, uh, and he's depicted as this comical yet menacing figure. Uh, and this is a cartoon from the 1943. Uh, not too long ago, um, you had a logo for one of the major uh, beverage companies in Japan, uh, Kaupis. Uh, which had a minstrel as its trademark. And that was introduced in the 1920s, 1923. And that was uh, on display on their beverage bottles until about 1988, when a controversy similar to the one that's taking place now occurred. And because of public pressure, um, uh, Calpis decided to remove the trademark. All right. Uh, but there again, you had a, a stereotypical uh, Minstrel, blackface minstrel, being depicted uh, in a in a in a, uh, um, a logo, uh, uh, a trademark. Um, uh, 
I think, uh, Mark, you had said that, you know, this is nothing new, and, and in some ways it isn't. I mean, uh, blackface in one form or another uh, has been repeated by a number of performers in Japan well before Downtown and Hamada-san uh, decided to do what they did over the, uh, the New Year's holiday, uh, the New Year's weekend, uh, New Year's Eve. Um, uh, as, as Bai pointed out, you had um, uh, Rats and Star, also known as uh, the Gospelers. They have a long tradition of performing in blackface. Uh, you have um, had other groups, uh, including the Tunnels, who have kind of done a Supremes parody, uh, where they're not only in blackface, but they're also in drag. Uh, you've had um, a, a, a long parade of Japanese performers. And interestingly enough, mostly during kind of the, uh, the New Year's festivities, where you mm -hmm. have the special programming. Uh, and it's kind of like, uh, you know, the Bonin Kai season. Uh, where people, uh, actors, uh, performers, comedians uh, adopt um, blackface caricature, or we can go into whether or not this is, is an homage or not later. But uh, and also, uh, you had products being um, um, on sale, uh, makeup uh, that would turn you into a a soul man uh, around the 1980s 19 early 1990s there were products sold in kind of novelty stores or well department stores actually uh, where you would have these uh, uh, afro wigs and black face uh, makeup and thick plastic red lips and you could wear this and, and become a soul man uh, so this tradition um, is something that has lasted for over a, cent a century and a half, if not more. Uh, so there's really nothing new to it. Um, what is new, I guess, is the fact that more so than before, because of the evolution of social media, uh, that more and more people are becoming aware of it. Uh, Bay uh, mentioned uh, the ANA ad. Uh, in this case, it wasn't a parody of blacks, it was a parody of, of white people. Uh, and also there was a Toshiba ad as well for a, a, a pan a bread maker that also made rice or a rice maker that also made uh, a bread. Uh, there was a commercial for um, umeshu uh, where the Japanese would drink the umeshu and turn into white people. Um, uh, you know, that in those kind of caricatures as white, of whites as well has been a tradition in Japan. Uh, but neither really been well known until fairly recently with the advent of, of, of social media. And, uh, and that has cre created a kind of a new dilemma for Japan as to how to, how to cope with that, how to deal with that. Um, um, okay. Thank, thank you for, uh, that was really terrific context to, to, uh, get a bit of big, bigger picture of, of what uh, what happened. Well, let, let me just add one more thing, though. And that is, is that, again, um, when I, I also saw this um, on television when it aired, I tuned in partway through, uh, and my feeling was deja vu all over again. Uh, in the 1980s, uh, in the early 1980s, you had a similar kind of uh, controversies being generated about not only blackface, but uh, caricatures of blacks, whether they were like the Daco Chan dolls uh, or other products that were being sold in Japan, Sambo dolls as well. Um, and it just seems that, you know, that pattern is being reproduced again. At that time, you didn't have social media, but you did have groups in Japan, uh, African-American expatriates, uh, Africans in Japan who protested, made known their disapproval of these things. And kind of like now, it was like, well, okay, we'll do something about it. We'll kind of listen. And for a while, these things disappeared. But then after a bit, they came, they reemerged again. And, uh, and that seems to be the general pattern. Uh, Bay had also said that uh, he was concerned that people seeing these images would think of Japan as being a racist country. And I should point out that in the 1980s, when there was a very strong sense of friction caused by the economic situation between 
the United States and Japan, the trade friction, there was a lot of discourse uh, in the United States about Japan being racist and being the most racist country in the world. And if you read Rising Sun by Michael Crichton, uh, one of the arguments that he makes is that uh, the Japanese are the most racist people on earth. Uh, and there were other articles and other books and fiction that reproduced that same claim. Uh, and so Japan is very much in danger of having that repeated uh, and having that sense of Japan being the most racist nation in the world or the most racist country in the world reproduced again uh, at a time when ironically, you know, that mantle is pretty much being uh, 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 held by America with its election of Trump. <laughs> so I, I want to bring uh, Utah in, into the, the conversation now. It's uh, a lot to, to follow on, but just from your own experience, when you first saw blackface maybe on TV or something, did you, did you know its history or its context? Well, if you ask me the first time I saw blackface, I don't really remember. But what I do remember is a few years ago, you know, Rats and Star, they appeared, you know, they were going to appear on TV in blackface. So I do remember that. Uh, but I think I'm, I don't remember the first time, but mm. I can kind of like intuitively understand that it's not really a good thing, you know, when I see it. So, but at the same time, I don't necessarily think that I represent Japanese people. Uh, so that like, uh, so I guess that's my reaction. You, you don't see yourself as the average Japanese person. I, I, I understand that. Um, but you do um, kind of take the pulse of, of Japanese by going out and, and doing these interviews. Um, do you think Japanese be surprised to find out that this blackface, uh, the, the, these kind of things, are offensive? No, I don't think they would be surprised if you talk about maybe the average-ish Japanese people. If you explain the history and if you explain why it's not a good thing, I think many Japanese people will just understand. Yeah, because there's nothing difficult about understanding it. But at the same time, so I saw some reactions on mm. social media by Japanese people. And if you go on the internet, I tend to think the people who are active on the internet, there's some kind of bias. They're mm. more on the, on the right side. They tend to be more nationalistic, you know? So, but some, of, some people get very, very defensive when these kind of things, you know, uh, happen. And I can cer certainly understand why they get defensive because it, they feel like it's part of the reason that is because it's coming from the United States. And people feel like uh, the United States of America, they kind of like, you know, push their agenda and kind of like bully other countries. So, but I don't think them being defensive has anything to do with like black people or blackface in general. It's just a kind of like a defensiveness. You feel like uh, when somebody, uh, comes to your country and tell like you're doing something wrong while you don't really have uh, bad intentions behind. So, and that I think makes things a little more complicated. Bai, would you, would you agree with that? Yeah, it does um, make it complicated. You talk, can I ask you a question though? Yeah, yeah. It's okay. Can we cross question? Yeah. Absolutely. No, no, that's more interesting. I, I don't <laughs> like talking, you know, by myself all the time. That's not, I'm not good at it. <laughs> I would just um, rather prefer you. Yeah, somebody asked me a question. Go for it. If, if, if 
because one of the predominant arguments that that I've I've read on uh, Twitter and Facebook is that um, it's not an issue in Japan because Japan does not have a history of blackface or history of racism against black people or history of racial discrimination against black people like America does. So it's a case of America, uh, Americans um, impressing their uh, issues upon Japan. And my question is, if Japanese people were aware of the history that that um, John just laid out for them, for 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 the people listening to this program. And if you think they were aware of that history, do you think that that particular argument would cease, or do you think that they would find some way to to maintain that argument? Um. I don't think that argument is too too it's kind of it's not because Japan doesn't have any history well it's um I think it's more like a cultural narrative and cultural expression because uh in in the culture in in American culture like blackface blackface is like a symbol it's like a word and it means something in some cultures and doesn't really mean anything in other cultures and in American culture, blackface has very, very negative connotations, and it has a certain meaning. It is kind of like symbolizes racism. But in the context of Japanese culture, it doesn't really have any meaning in terms of like a cultural narrative. You can say that it should have some like a meaning. You can say, oh, Japan also has a history of you know, discriminating against black people. But in the current contemporary Japanese culture, it doesn't really have that meaning. So Japanese people doing something in blackface, they don't have the intention. And in the Japanese culture, people don't see, people don't necessarily see this as racist. racist. So in that sense, I can understand why Japanese people kind of like uh, argue against you. It's not necessarily because Japan is, Japan is free from racism or anything. Right. Or no history whatsoever of racism or discrimination. Okay. Well, I have another question then for John. Okay. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Do, do, you, do you think it's possible that, uh, according to the, the, the history, you know, the, not the fake news, the real, the facts, Japan, um, blackface was introduced to Japan in a racist context. And is it possible that even though it developed not in the same, not in the same way that it developed in America, but it developed in its own, it took its own path here in Japan. Is it possible that it evolved from being a, a, a racist form of entertainment into homage? Mm. Um, 150 years? Yeah. I think that I agree with Utah son when he says that you know the, the meanings are somewhat different, okay, and, and because the histories are different, um, I would have problems though extending that to say that well, um, for example, you know just because there was racism in the United States and blackface emerged out of that, that because you know the context of Japan is different, uh, that blackface hasn't acquired the same meanings. Um, there's, there's some truth to that, but at the same time, I think you have to keep in mind that one, there is racism in Japan, uh, and two, caricature, uh, stereotypes, uh, whether they're, they're blackface or their other manifestations of that are an expression, uh, and very useful to maintaining those ideas of, of, of racial superiority, uh, in Japan as well. Um, John Dower, the historian, makes a very good point in his book, War Without Mercy, which is about the, the conflict between uh, the United States and Japan, the uh, Pacific War, where he says that if you look at Japan's history, um, a lot of history in terms of Japan's dealings with non-whites was to elevate Japan above non-whites so that they could feel themselves in a sense, uh, elevated to the level or close to the level of whites, okay? 
and I think that it, it, it was less a denigration, a, a specific or a overt de de degeneration or de degradation of, of, of blacks. That was the goal. Rather, the goal was to elevate Japanese to a, a higher level. Okay, and, and you get that with Japan wanting to leave Asia and to westernize and to take on the trappings of westernization, which equals whiteness. Um, I think that's a, a really major factor here. Uh, it explains a lot. Um, the other thing I would say is, is that in hearing kind of the, the rationales that Japanese give for, you know, not believing that, that blackface is offensive, you know, America also has to do a little bit of a, of a soul search, because I think the same arguments are being made and continue to be made not 100 years ago, but presently concerning red face and the Redskins. And people right. go to their baseball games and say, well, we're not against a, uh, Native Americans. You know, we just, you know, we we <laughs> love their, their tomahawks. Right. Uh, and it's the same kind of logic that's at work, uh, which might explain to some extent, on the other hand, why, for example, if you look at a lot of the the, 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 the reaction to uh, the performance uh, in blackface on internet, you have a lot of Japanese denying racism or ill intent, but you also have an awful lot of Americans. More. You know, it's a, yes, probably even that, more, who are saying, you know, well, let the social justice warriors battle it out in the States. Don't bring it over here. You know, we don't need that. We don't need this cry over racism and, and this cry over these overly sensitive minorities coming in Japan and, and, and all of this. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a really complex, uh, convoluted situation that we have here. Um, and I think that when, again, to get back to Japan though, I think that when it comes to Japan, that there is though a tendency to deny that there is racism here. Uh, and if the article that I wrote in 2015 began with a, um, a, a, a mixed race, a Japanese black mixed race uh, individual who had, wrote, who had written uh, in one of the internet blogs or whatever that, you know, he didn't think that, even though Japanese say that they may admire um, Japanese, he really didn't think based on his experiences that they would, you know, they, if, if they had to choose, if they could come, if they could become black, they wouldn't choose it, okay? No matter how much they admired black people. Uh, and I think there's a grain of truth in that. If you look at the kind of, of bullying, the kind of Ijime that mixed uh, race individuals here face, Okay, um, that television show is basically, you know, a, a, a primer on Ijime, all right? And although uh, Hamada-san may be, uh, who I understand is a big fan of Eddie Murphy, may be thinking that, you know, well, this is my homage to Eddie Murphy. A lot of people, especially a lot of young people who weren't around in the 1980s, who didn't see that little caption at the bottom, which had the picture of Eddie Murphy and who he was and what the film was that he was in. Those who didn't see that, I don't think will see Eddie Murphy. I think they'll see a black person or, or, or a caricature of a black person. And they'll use that so that when they see a real person with dark skin, that'll be a, a means of, of, of bullying them and degrading them and, and hurting them. And that's a reality, I think, that hasn't been addressed in this controversy. Okay, that there are people who will be hurt because of this. Okay, and they aren't necessarily American. They aren't necessarily African American. They aren't necessarily African, but they are Japanese who, because of their roots, don't look, quote, Japanese, and who will be tormented and abused and bullied because of that. Now, that's an issue, considering the issue of, of, of bullying now, that's an issue that the media should be focusing on. But they're not going to do that. Okay, and very rarely when it comes to an issue like this, when it comes to confronting the issue of racism, here we're talking about, um, you know, uh, performances that can be uh, interpreted as anti-black, okay? The media isn't going to deal with that, just like they don't deal basically with a lot of the racism that is extended towards other minorities in Japan. It, don't become a, it doesn't become a pressing issue here. 
It does in, in, in newspapers like the Japan Times, but in, 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 in the Asahi maybe, uh, but in, 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 in the general you know, mainstream media, especially in the climate, the political climate of today, uh, they don't become, that doesn't become a major issue. And those are the issues that need to be confronted um, and, and, and faced. And it seems to be something that, that those who control the gates, the gatekeepers of, Ameri of Japanese popular culture and media seem to be shying away from. Mm. I mind. wonder you, you you were talking about how younger younger people might not realize that's Eddie Murphy, and I'm wondering, maybe I'm being too optimistic, but this is might be a generational thing. Mm. It, Every year for the last twenty four years or whatever, I've done a, a, a survey when I teach my anthropology class. I ask my students uh, to list. Um, um, famous celebrities or, or, or or not even just celebrities, black people that they know or they know of, okay? And the names change, all right? Uh, and for now, for example, the name Eddie Murphy rarely ever comes up, okay? Uh, for the last maybe three or four years, I, you know, Eddie Murphy, Michael Jackson rarely comes up now, okay? Other celebrities come up, uh, but but those don't. So I think there is a generational gap. And I also think that in part explains, again, why there was this little clip, uh, this caption, when Hamada-san first debuted as, as, as uh, his personification of, uh, of, of Eddie Murphy, saying, you know, you had the picture of Eddie Murphy, and then you had, you know, uh, Beverly Hills Cop, uh, and Eddie Murphy appeared in this or whatever. Because I think a lot of young people, uh, certainly those born after the 1980s, uh, really aren't familiar with Eddie Murphy and his work. Uh, and when they do see it, they're going to say, well, it's going to be humorous, but you're going to be wondering, what are they laughing at? Okay. Uh, are they, they, are they laughing at Hamada-san because he's got this weird appearance, but okay, what's weird about it? Why is that weird? Why is that funny? Uh, it's also interesting to note that again, um, when this was rebroadcast, uh, with the, you know, the edited out scenes had been restored and, and and some of the scenes from the original broadcast was there. Uh, um, actually, I, it even goes before that, I'm sorry. The original broadcast, uh, there's a scene where it, Matsumoto is getting on the bus uh, it, with his other uh, companions who are dressed as policemen. And uh, um, Hamada-san is there and he gets on the bus and he notices that uh, Hamada-san is laughing Okay, and so he, he, he turns around and he gets off the bus and he says, you know, the black is laughing. Kokujin wa waratteru. Okay, if that's Eddie Murphy, why didn't he say, well, well Eddie's laughing. Okay, the black is laughing. Mm -hmm. And that was repeated at least um, two, maybe three times. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yes, it may be a, a, a caricature of, of uh, or, or homage to, um, to Eddie Murphy, but I think for a lot of viewers watching it, a lot of Japanese viewers included, that's going to be just another one of those performances of where a Japanese person adopts blackface uh, for whatever reason, okay? But still, it's going to be as a comical uh, element and it's going to be dismissed as that. Uh, it's also interesting that, you know, you mentioned, uh, Mark, that uh, in following up and in interviewing, uh, what is it? Um, it wasn't Fuji, Nihon Television, Nihon Television, that they said, well, we'll, we'll look at the commentary and uh, we'll use it as feedback. And yet, as, 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 as Bai mentioned, they not only repeated it in the rebroadcast of the sections that had been edited, but also at the conclusion of that broadcast, they sing a song. There's a rap song, ironically enough, that they sing that encapsulates uh, all of the... Uh, little acts and skits that they did. And when it came to um, the scene with Hamada-san as, as, as Eddie Murphy, um, the, the lyric in the rap was, um, one, of, you know, one of us uh, was in blackface and that caused kind of uh, a controversy. It was Yabai, Yabai. And we learned to um, 
kind of be careful about that or we notice that, mm. okay? Which is interesting because if they noticed it and if they're acknowledging that they noticed it, why did they repeat it? Mm. Which means it's kind of like thumbing your nose, basically. Okay? Yeah. We know, we heard, we heard your argument. Uh, we know that some people were offended, but so what? So mm. they did, and that's it. Uh, and that's really the disturbing part. What's less disturbing about, um, what's more disturbing about uh, Hamada-san and his impression is the reaction to it. Okay, the fact that there were so many people, both Japanese and non-Japanese, who were offended by this, and yet, you know, the media's response seems to be that, well, so what? We really don't care. I think that's the more offensive aspect of it. The fact that you have a large population of people who were offended, and yet for some reason that offense doesn't mean anything. That's oversensitivity. That's just the most, I think, disturbing part of it. But it's something that, again, whenever these events take place, uh, it's something that is, is repeated and repeated and repeated, and uh, with very little uh, change uh, occurring, uh, any very little enlightenment uh, occurring afterwards. Uh, I've been getting a from from the beginning of this campaign. I've gotten a lot of emails and messages from Japanese people in support of what I've been doing, and some of them have been so moving. And I'm gonna I'm, I'm collating them into an article. So my next black eye is gonna be these letters from mm -hmm. Japanese people who have expressed their thoughts on blackface. And I, I look forward to, to sharing that with the public because I don't think enough people know. Mm. I think a lot of, many Japanese people have been quiet, even the ones who have been you know, disturbed by what they saw, they haven't really spoken up. But I, I you know, a, a, a good number of them were moved to the point where they had to contact me in Japanese and English. And you know, they just said, listen, I had to talk to you. I mean, it's been overwhelming. I had people call me on Skype, you know, strangers calling me on Skype talking about, I just gotta talk to you about this right now. It's the middle of the night. I'm like, hey, what? Like, I just saw, I just saw what you said on BBC, and I saw, you know, I heard what you, I, you know, I read your tweets, I read the story in, in Huff Post, and you're absolutely right. Japan has to make some, you know, some significant changes. We need to do it now. So they was, they were strongly, you know, motivated by this. So in a good, in, in that way, I think it might, it might result in some good, in some good things, you know, that they were so dismissive of people's feelings, Japanese people's feelings. This might work against them. So, you know, we'll see. We'll see how it plays out. But, you know, so far, you're right. They're thumbing their noses. John, you're absolutely right. Can I ask something? Sure. Yeah. So just in case you're wondering, I'm not in favor of blackface or whatsoever. Just for the sake of this conversation, I'm trying to offer different perspective. Mm -hmm. But overall, I'm not, I don't approve of, you know, him being in blackface in the PM on Japanese TV. Uh, I also have a, a problem with those like uh, so-called variety shows in, you know, in Japan. And that's part of the reason why I don't watch Japanese TV. For example, I grew up, you know, my, both my parents are Japanese, but we weren't actually allowed to watch those Japanese TV shows because my parents thought those were very bad influences. So I'm not too, too familiar with, for example, like Downtown is a very famous comedy group in Japan. They, I do know them, but I'm not too, too familiar, familiar with them because I've never really watched their shows. And, but I did a little bit of research and it seems like there's always something very, very problematic coming up, coming up all those like uh, uh, Japanese TV shows. Mm -hmm. And there was one instance where uh, a female Japanese celebrity was like a kicked very hard by like a professional. I don't know if she was professional, but you know, professional like a Thai kickboxer or something like that. And she got, she was very really hurt. And guys around her was like laughing at her. And I saw the clip and I thought it was very, very problematic. But again, Japanese TV, they just brush it off as like, oh, you're too sensitive. You know, it's just comedy. But in my opinion, that went too far. So 
I just want to mention that Japanese TV shows sometimes have, you know, they do something very problematic. And I also want to add that what John just described, you know, what really happened on TV, it was very, very interesting because uh, I think part of the reason why some Japanese people feel very defensive about blackface is probably they think that people focus too much on just the blackface, but ignoring the context, what you actually do in blackface. But if you add some more context, you know, this person behaves this way, he behaved this way in blackface, like kind of like a personifying black people. And just he because he did this with this intention, it's wrong. I think this kind of more like contextual argument is more important and it helps Japanese people understand and helps them be aware of their own like racial biases because I think many people, you know, Japanese people, American people, many people have racial biases. And they're not necessarily aware of those biases. And I think addressing those biases and make people aware is very, very important. Yeah, I, I agree it's with- Certainly more e easier for Japanese people to understand uh, because like uh, something that is different for, uh, because people say, oh, this is racist and attack, attack, attack. And when you do that, people get defensive and they don't really listen, but if you say something like, oh, you know, I understand your culture and you know where you come from, but if somebody do this in this kind of like, you know, costume, you know, that would make feel us this way. And that kind of like a way of putting it is way easier to understand for people. I, I, I agree with that. And I think that if, especially if you're looking at, at what Bay has written, mm -hmm. that, you know, he, he hasn't come off, and I certainly I hope I haven't come off as saying that, you know, this is definitively racist. Uh, there is an element of, of homage in these uh, uh, performances, uh, but at the same time, it's important to recognize the, the impact that some of these images will have on on you know the people who are in a sense the targets of uh, these uh, representations, uh, and I think that you know that awareness or that kinds of sensitivity, not oversensitivity, but just an awareness that th this is another way that it can be interpreted, seems to be lost uh, and forgotten about and, and not really uh, examined uh, in the Japanese media uh, and when this is discussed. Uh, and I think that's, that's the most discouraging part of it. Uh, in that if you do raise it, I mean, if you go through the internet and you look at some of the comments, it's like, well, the people who are saying this is racist are racist. Uh, you get a lot of that kind of, 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 of argument as well. Uh, that those who are making the charge of themselves uh, guilty of, of being racist. Uh, I think that the point that I that both uh, uh, buy it and I think I'm trying to make is that, you know, there is a contextual matter, but there's also the fact that you have to realize that those images have a practical impact on people. Uh, and that Japan has its own indigenous domestic racism as well, or discrimination as well, or racial bias as well. And that, that also has to be looked at and examined in an honest way. Uh, a lot of the discourse is kind of, well, you know, Japan doesn't have racism. Japan doesn't have uh, a racial bias. Uh, and in that sense, trying to deny that any of these problems exist at all. Uh, and I think that's a very problematic uh, stance to take. Uh, again, I'm not denying that some of these performances, the intent is not to be racist. The intent is not to um, degrade uh, people of color or, or af people of African descent. Um, but at the same time, there are situations within this society and that have been here for a very long time where people of African descent and other people of color in Japan uh, are, have to face discrimination. And in some cases, 
these kinds of performances help to support and, bust, and buttress that. And that has to be acknowledged as well. Yeah, go for it. I would like to, I want to ask a question for you, know, you, for you guys, because I want, I want to hear your responses. Because, uh, so this black face issue, there's one thing that's, that makes a little more complicated is that there doesn't seem to be any definitive consensus, even uh, among black people. For example, I watched some of the clips of YouTube comments and I saw many comments, oh, you know, I'm African American, but I don't find this offensive at all. It's just a humor. So there seems to be a divide between even black people among themselves, let alone like African American people. And I also asked about this, you know, blackface thing to uh, my black friends around the world. So I asked some like uh, people from Uganda, Kenya, uh, Britain, Dominican Republic, many, you know, people. And I, I got very mixed uh, opinions on this. Some people find it offensive, but some people say, oh, I don't find it offensive at all. It's just, you know, comedy. So I would like to hear you, you guys' opinions on this. <laughs> I, I wrote a post about this just last week. But um, <clears throat> I think that, uh, first of all, you can't trust YouTube commenters. It could be anybody. You know, I, anytime I see someone well, I who says, I'm an African American. I know, I know in person, so. Oh, you know the person? Yeah, I, I, I ask oh. people, you know, I personally know. So okay. I know they're not some kind of a crazy, you know, and I half of them, half of them are familiar with Japanese culture, but half of them are not familiar, familiar with Japanese culture. I'm, I'm not doubting you. I'm saying I have friends too, who, who are like, you are making, no, you're making a lot out yeah. of nothing. Yeah. I, I'm not saying just because some black people say it's okay, it's, it makes it okay. I just want to hear your opinion, you guys' opinions. That would be my opinion. My opinion is that black is no more monolith than Japanese are monolith. You know, I mean, we have a, a whole diversity of opinions. There's a whole, I mean, the, the, the diversity of black thought will blow. Well, you're in Uganda right now, so you know who I'm talking about. I mean, yeah, of course. Me, me, I think me and you have more in common than me and the Ugandan probably. So I'm just saying it's, it's, you know, there's no way to put black people on, on the same sheet on the same page. And, and that's even among um, African Americans because we all have so varied experiences and, and upbringings and backgrounds and education. And, you know, it's just, you know, you're going to get varied opinions when you have people with, um, you know, various backgrounds. So when I encounter someone who has a differing opinion, um, about blackface, I, you know, I have to remain patient. A black person I'm talking about, I have to remain patient and try to understand their perspective. But um, yeah, I mean, there's no, we're not on the page. We're not, we're not all on the same page. But I think there's a, a general consensus. But definitely, we're not all on the same page. Never have been on anything. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was black people who opposed Martin Luther King, you know, who opposed Malcolm X, who opposed, you know, people that you would think that what. They didn't like Martin Luther King. Yeah, they didn't like Martin Luther King. They thought he was a uh, you know, pacifist. And that, you know, that wasn't called for. There was more revolutionary um, um, you know, activities that need to be you know, undertaken more so than um, uh, the, the way the approach that Martin Luther King uh, approached uh, civil rights. So there's, there's, there's never been a 100% a, a consensus in the black community, even in, a, even in the United States. So I am not surprised when I run into people who don't agree that blackface um, is an issue. And I, and I think there's a lot of, of victim blaming here. So I think a lot of people want to, uh, they want to avoid being called a victim or being labeled a victim. So they will go out of their way to make sure that doesn't occur. Even they'll even go as far as to say blackface is not an issue so that no, so everybody can look at them and say, oh, he's not a victim. He's our kind of guy, you know? I think this is, Sometimes I see it as them trying to, to, to uh, bolster themselves as like a defense against victimization, and you know I, I can't fault them for that because there's a lot of victimizing, actual victimizing happening in the world. So, as a black person, you know you do have to find ways to 
to uh, defend yourself or protect yourself against that kind of uh, assaults that are coming from, you know, all kinds of sources, you know, Japanese, from, from white, from black people, that, you know, people are saying, oh, man, that's the victim mentality. You're, you're, you know, you, you, you know, you can't, if you go that route, man, people are going to, you know, you, you're not worthy of respect if you, if you accept that, that, um, of the label of a victim and, um, people resist that with all their, well, they have, <laughs> I've seen it, I've done it. You know, so I, I can totally identify with a person who he might he might not be he might not think that blackface is uh you know is he doesn't find it he doesn't think that it's something that should be going on, but at the same time he's not gonna that's not gonna be his fight. You know, he's gonna choose his fights, he's gonna fight for against police brutality, he's gonna fight against something that you know, something that he can feel that is is, is substantial and that people that everybody can get on the same page that this is a wrong, you know, they're not going to fight against the, the little things or what they consider to be little things like blackface. Can, can, I, can I raise one thing, one thing that, that um, um, among the critics, critics, they said that uh, Eddie Murphy himself did whiteface where he did racial uh, caricatures um, on Saturday Night Live mm -hmm. and in his movies. And I think Dave Chappelle has done a kind of similar thing. How how do you answer that? I mean, is there an equivalency, or is that somehow make you know nullify it? Okay, um, let me try to first address Yuta San's question about. Sorry, yeah. Uh, and I think that context is important. Uh, I don't I don't deny that. Uh, I think when parody is involved, I mean, legitimate parody. Uh, is involved in trying to address an issue. Uh, in some cases, I think that, that, that blackface is uh, not necessarily acceptable, but at least uh, justifiable. Um, um, I also think that there are cases, this, for example, I'll give you some cases from America. Uh, there's a comedian, Billy Crystal, who uh, he also kind of like, if, if Hamasan's a big fan of uh, of Eddie Murphy, Billy Crystal's a big fan of uh, of Sammy Davis Jr. And he does a wonderful Sammy Davis Jr. impersonation without makeup. But he has, uh, in the past, uh, performed in very uh, uh, realistic uh, makeup as, a, as, uh, as um, Sammy Davis Jr. Okay, uh, and he and you can tell he's not, you know, this doing this kind of entertaining. This black entertainer, he is doing an impression of Sammy Davis Jr. He has the voice down, he has the mannerisms down, uh, he has the attitude down, and because of the prosthetic makeup, he even looks uh, very much like uh, like Sammy Davis. Um, now, there's some people who will totally object to that, but I can kind of see that. I can I can accept that. That's my own personal opinion. Okay, that doesn't speak for every African American person, anyone who has black skin or a person of color. But I can kind of accept that. Um, there's also, and this is also somewhat controversial, um, Robert Downey Jr. Uh, in Tropic. Um, I can't remember the hmm? Thunder. Tropic Tropic Thunder. Yes. Um, plays a black actor. He plays a white actor playing a, a black actor playing a black actor or something. It's, 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 but it's, it's a wonderful parody because he's not, he's the, the object, the target of the, of the humor is not that he's making fun of black people, but that he's making fun of white stereotypes of black people. Okay. That's the context. Okay. And if, if it's in that kind of a context where it, if it, it forces you or enables you to kind of confront your own stereotypes, then I think there's a legitimate purpose or a legitimate use of blackface or other kinds of, of, of racial mimicry. And to go to Mark's question, again, if you're looking at David Chappelle or if you're looking at Eddie Murphy in their whiteface performances, again, that is kind of a, of, of a parody of working with stereotypes and trying to make people, make explicit the kind of stereotypes that people have of white people, okay? Uh, and I can see that as a legitimate form of, of social commentary, okay? Um, um, 
and 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 and, and, and reflective of kind of you know the, the racial biases and the racial obsessions that we have in the United States. Okay, um, when you look at 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 Hamada-san's impression, I'm sorry, you know, putting on a a, a lion's jacket and an Afro wig and really shoddy um, blackface makeup it doesn't make you into Eddie Murphy, okay? Eddie Murphy's gestures aren't there. The things that would define Eddie Murphy as an entertainer, as an individual, are not there, okay? Uh, and, and I think that's problematic. There's another comedian, I think it's Unchan Nanchan. I think it's, uh, which one is it? I don't remember, it might be Unchan, <laughs> who, is, who likes uh, Bruce Lee. You know, he's mm -hmm. a Bruce Lee fanatic. Right. And he'll do all of these Bruce Lee uh, imitations. To some extent, you know, you can see in his mimicry of Bruce Lee, his, you know, uh, adoration of, of Bruce Lee. Okay. Uh, I don't see that uh, when I look at, at Hamada-san in his makeup. Okay. I, there's a difference, I think. Uh, and, and one of the things about mimicry in order for it not to be a racial caricature, is that it captures the peculiarities of of the person that you're you're mimicking. Okay, good impressionists do that. You know, when I was growing up in the '60s, you had David Fry and and Frank Gorshin. They would do uh, celebrity uh, impersonations, and they would just through the contortions of their face muscles and their posture, they would become. You know, you could see the actor of the that they were trying to. Um, to emulate, okay, uh, that is is impression. That is is uh, a, a kind of mimicry that you don't see in what passes in, as mimicry in Japan. The other thing that I would add to that is that there there's a safety factor here as well. There are certain people, there are certain groups that you can mimic, or that you can tie kick in the ass like they did Becky, okay, who was you know the bad girl because of her scandal. Okay, so this is a good time to get revenge on her and to make her the object of ridicule and also make her feel and experience pain, perhaps because they felt that maybe what she did was a national humiliation. Who knows? Okay, but there are certain people who become targets of, 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 of mimicry and of the kind of, of comical violence that you see on a lot of Japanese television. In contrast, when was the last time you saw someone mimic or put on the persona of someone in political power in Japan. Where's the political satire? Where are the Abe-sans and the other politicians? Where are, their, where are the comedians that mimic them? You don't find them. You'll find them outside, but you won't find them on the stage, or you'll find them on the stage, but you won't find them on television, okay? And I think that's an issue that needs to be addressed as well, okay? There is no political satire here. The people that you can satirize, the people that you can go after there's a certain selected group, okay, and those are generally those who are not, who who have very little power, who are, you know, ma, yuaimono ijime, the people who you can, you can, the weak people who you can get after, or who are perceived as weak or, or powerless, and that's something that I think again needs to be needs to be confronted here, needs to be addressed, and it's something that an issue that the media should take up because that's something that they don't address as well. You know, you, you look at some of the variety shows, you design, you were saying how, you know, your parents wouldn't allow you to look at, at Japanese television. You know, a lot of Sunday news programs air. Interestingly, interestingly enough, the, on Sunday, none of them mentioned this particular case. Uh, but one of the, the glaring things about some of these programs is, you know, you have the cameras lingering on the breasts and the legs of the, of the female ingenues who are there to give their opinions on things, all at the same time talking about maybe sexism or race uh, or, 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 you know, uh, gender inequality. And yet the camera lingers lovingly over these, over these, you know, ingenues while they give their opinions. Okay. These, these are current affairs programs. Okay. But, but, you know, and they'll, they'll talk about political issues, but yet the way that they highlight their female uh, commentators, celebrity commentators, is, is shows a certain lack of sophistication. 
not a certain lack, but a major lack of sophistication. Yeah, about the, uh, we're going to have to wrap this up pretty soon, as, although I do want to continue um, talking about a lot of this stuff, but the <clears throat> the lack of uh, political comedy or social commentary comedy is, is pretty glaring. Um, however, there is a comedian, I think, I think he's called uh, Woman, Woman Rush Hour. Have you heard of this guy? Um, he has kind of dared to be a little bit political in his, his comedy. So again, I, I kind of, I'm again, I don't know if I'm being overly optimistic, but there is a, uh, I mean, you do have a lot of kids that grew up with hip hop, right? And they have perhaps a better, I don't know, I'm, I'm generalizing, but they have more of an understanding of, of, of black culture. And I've never seen a, a hip hop group do blackface, right? Because they know it's it's taboo, so th that's why I said earlier that I felt like maybe it's a it's an older man's thing, and they that that the younger generation don't really see the the humor in that, or they they're maybe more uh, culturally attuned. I don't know. That was one of the, the more upsetting things about the Rats and Star because when I did the petition in 2015, what they were doing is of course it's kind of well not acceptable but at least you know they were doing black music and doo-wop that was supposed to be their thing paying paying homage to, to motown type music and the costumes and the white gloves and everything even though i don't remember any motown acts having the white gloves but what they were doing in 2015 is you know they were partnering up with Momo Ito Clovazetta. they had nothing to do with doo-wop or black music or anything why are they in blackface so it felt like they were trying to pass this this baton of ignorance onto the next generation, and you know I, I think that kind of really you know fired me up. I said no, it's time to really stop because I've seen I've been here ten years before I did that petition. And I, so I've seen Rats and Stars throughout that entire time, you know. But I was never you know I, I kind of felt at that time not really fully vested in Japan or at a point where I feel like I should be able to to I should be saying anything about what's going on here. It's like if you live here, you have to accept that this is the the culture and these are the type of things that are that you're supposed to tolerate. You know, when you're living in another country, you're supposed to you know adapt to their cultural norms. But um, when I saw that, I said I, I need to find out how other people feel about this and how you know do Japanese people feel okay with this older generation passing on their black face to a hmm. totally you know. Uh, a, a total a, a group that has nothing to do with black music or anything like that, or black culture, and apparently, five, you know, at least a, a good number of them were not. So, yeah, I, I'm trouble. I was troubled by that. I, now, I'm not sure about the, whether the hip hop guys are doing blackface or not. I mean, I see some of them. Uh, <laughs> I see some. I see some some questionable stuff, man. Mm -hmm. well, I see you laughing, John. Well, have you seen some things? No, I haven't. I haven't seen no, I, uh, any uh, in black. Any face, in black. But I mean, we, <laughs> there was a sense of you know, copying, copying, copying you know the the, the the mannerisms, which kind of gives pause. Yeah. Um, but that's a different issue. Yeah. <laughs> okay, guys. Well, we we had said it was going to be forty five minutes. We've gone into like almost an hour and a half. So. Um, wow! I really, Time flies. Hmm. I really appreciate you uh, coming together and talk about this. Um, I think, I think we all learned, and hopefully our viewers uh, learned a lot more about the the context of this um, incident. And uh, I don't know if this this is going to bring about uh, change, uh, but it, it, it's just one baby step, perhaps. Hopefully. Hopefully. Uh, and thank you for uh, uh, patching in Utah all the way from Uganda. I, I really appreciate that. Thank you very much for having me. It was mm -hmm. very interesting and very educational as well. You know, I did something, learned new today. So thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Mark.
Yeah, thanks, Mark. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, I hope, I hope. Thank you very much. I, I don't want to talk about this topic again. <laughs> but I hope yeah. we can have a, a similar discussion maybe sometime in the future. Well, you know, Black Panther's going to have a premiere here in a couple of months. Okay. I'm scared, I'm scared man. <laughs> I'll keep that in mind. Okay. Okay, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Good evening. Bye. Bye. Hey, John. Yeah. I want to talk.